Um, okay, so yeah, let's kick it off. And I see a lot of familiar faces now at this point. So I, I think we're having a great audience. You guys keep coming back for more. It's great. Um, so this is part of our free to fly series. Uh, we launched this, we're calling it a virtual flyway project back in the spring in response to the proposed changes to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And I just wanted to let everyone know in case you missed our action alert a couple weeks ago that there has been an awesome development in that um, the proposed changes to the Treaty Act um, have been held up in court. Not cool, not good against the purpose of the original uh, act. So that's a great step, but it's definitely not the end. And we are going to keep on keeping on with both the Treaty Act and the Protection Act, um, which we covered in previous webinars. But I just wanted to give that quick update to that. And on that note, we're still accepting submissions to our virtual flyway because the need is very much still there. Um, so if you haven't submitted your favorite bird to our uh, project, I still encourage you to do so. And I'll give you a couple more details on how to do that at the end of the presentation. But for now, I wanna turn it over to Erica and I'm gonna let Erica introduce herself um, so you can find her video. And a couple just tips on that. I, if you wanna watch both the presentation and see Erica talking, I would switch to speaker view so you can find that video. Um, otherwise, you can keep it on gallery view and kind of watch everyone else's faces as well. It's always kind of fun. Um, so Erica, I'm going to turn it over to you so we can find you because I've lost you on my screen. <laughs> and then you can introduce yourself. Cool. Thanks, Nicole and Luke. Um, yeah, so my name is Erica Prather. I'm an organizer with Defenders of Wildlife. I'm also based here in Tucson, Arizona, and um, really excited to be back. I think that you know, when we're able to work together as organizations, it just showcases. I'm not sure everybody knows that you know, Defenders and Audubon were in coalition together on several different issues that we're actually gonna talk about today. Um, and that really working in coalition and collaboration is the only way forward in this kind of nightmare of a political landscape. And it's a lot more fun to work together. So um, I'm really excited if you guys uh, played Jeopardy a couple months ago with me in this silly named webinar, I don't care about birds. Um, this won't be as bizarre, but it'll still be fun. So um, buckle up, we're gonna connect a lot of dots today. So I feel like right now we're in this like, like 2020 is just this insane year where it's like, what do I care about? I care about all these issues. Um, that's kind of why I was playing around with that title, I Don't Care About Birds, because it seems kind of silly sometimes. Maybe not to you all, but maybe to your friends or family or people that you want to share some of this advocacy um, intelligence with. And the, the truth of the matter is that all of these systems of oppression are connected. I think it also might be kind of weird to people. It's like, why is, why is Audubon like, tweeting about Black Lives Matter or Defenders of Wildlife. Like, why are we, why are we engaging in this issue all of a sudden? Um, and really, it's just something that's long overdue. Um, I think the systems that are in place through, you know, white supremacy and just basically colonial ideology and othering of either humans or interspecies relatives are really kind of have the same nucleus. So, um, I know it's like a lot to just, we're constantly digesting information and news and kind of wondering how we can encapsulate caring about all these issues, but I think we can still do it through the lens of biodiversity um, and just being more conscious of how we're even presenting and, and sharing that information. So um, we are going to talk about the link between biodiversity and pandemics for sure, but kind of like we're going to, we're just going to, we're going to do it all. It's going to be an amazing Neapolitan ice cream um, of information. So I saw this meme a couple months ago and I was like, oh no, uh, kind of insinuating that these things are not connected, that like climate change, the economic crisis and COVID-19 are like, you know, one's worse than the other or whatever. But the truth of the matter is they're all part of the same really bad positive feedback cycles. And I think, again, like understanding where those kind of nest is important to see how they connect and then also how to tackle these issues. Um, so again, I don't want you to feel like also after we're done that there's just no hope. There's, there's much hope. And that's like a lot of, you know, what Nicole and I do is 
trying to not just connect these dots, but then show you all how you can take action and protect the things that you love and protect yourself and the people you care about all at the same time. So I don't think it's probably any news to anybody on this webinar, but it's just worth kind of when we kind of start to back up and say, okay, how is it that we're all sitting behind our computer screens right now, separate from each other, we're in this pandemic, that's where we're really going to start. Like, how did this pandemic happen? Um, and how, how, you know, scientists keep telling us that if we don't address extinction and biodiversity loss, that we're going to have more pandemics. And so it's important to just start with the depressing refresher, but it's a really cool graphic that we are um, in the middle of the sixth extinction. Uh, it's human caused. And, um, you know, not only is that fact there that we've lost 30% of birds in North America since 1970, there's some pretty grim stats out there. In 100 years, we're projected to have no insects. Um, by the year 2050, our oceans are projected to have no fish. It, it seems almost like too horrifying to be true, um, but that's the trajectory we're on. And we really have to kind of ground ourselves in that knowledge in order to, um, to really kind of get the fire in the belly to take direct action um, every day. So I love this little tree of life because I think sometimes we forget that we have all these lovely relatives like sponges and like water bears. What is that? Just really funky little cool creatures. Um, to understand also, you know, I feel like sometimes, you know, we want to separate ourselves from this, this greater tree and think like, oh, you know, other beings don't experience stress or have feelings. Like I got out the vacuum today and I can tell you that my dog um, definitely experiences stress in that moment. I think we've all seen animals experience stress and especially our, our closest interspecies relatives, right? Like mammals and everything in that little kind of top left bubble. So when you experience stress, um, you are probably all familiar with this. Your heart rate increases, your stomach might feel weird, but there's also these other physiologically physiological things happening, like you are shedding viruses. That's something that you can totally do without even knowing it. If you are sick, you can become immunocompromised. Um, you know, even just the presence of something like as silly and gross as a wart is actually a virus in your body, letting itself be known. Um, and if you're a little bit, you know, your immune system's down, that's, that's like a, a possibility. So there's lots of ways that our bodies respond to stress. And again, our interspecies relatives go through that exact same process. We share DNA, a lot of our physiological uh, processes with our interspecies relatives. So I think it's important to, to kind of have those two building blocks when we start talking about like, how did this pandemic happen? How are we in this situation where all these things collide? Um, so here on the right is a picture of the Wuhan wet market. I do want to say that this is not just something that's like, exclusive to China. It's like incredibly racist to call this a Chinese virus. Like it's not, you know, it's, it happened in the Wuhan wet market, but things like this have happened before. Um, it's just that it's on everyone's radar because the entire globe is shut down. So the photo on the right, you see these um, cool animals. I actually have no idea what they are, but they are stacked on top of each other in really tight cages. Like, how would you feel? What would your body's response be if you were in that situation? Probably not cool. So um, at the Wuhan wet market, we've got lots of different species that typically are not interacting with each other. They're peeing on each other, pooping on each other, bleeding on each other, like all kinds of fluids are moving within, with each other. And they're also highly, highly stressed. Um, so they could, be, they could be shedding viruses, they're immunocompromised. Like it is just the perfect soupy bad storm to create the prime conditions for a pandemic to happen. I have no idea what that red line is that just appeared on my screen. <laughs> it looks like a paintbrush, but oh well. Um, so this cool little animal is a pangolin. We don't have any in North America, but um, it is an endangered species. Again, like beyond just the wet market, um, illegal wildlife trade is a massive problem. Again, it's not necessarily like on the forefront of anybody's mind with the world's problems, but like here we are, like it's drastically affected our economy, healthcare, jobs, et cetera. So it's one of those things where like we, we really do need to, to tap into this and care. Um, you know, zoonotic pathogens, that's a fancy word for 
a disease that makes a jump from one of our interspecies relatives to ourselves. This is not new. Um, the you know AIDS crisis started from consuming bush meat in Africa. Ebola was because a little boy somewhere in Africa was like got covered in some bird poop under a tree. SARS, West Nile Lyme disease. These are all pathogens that originated in a different animal and then made a jump to us. So this is like it's not going away. It's a it's a problem, um, and so we need to find some solutions. Um, Besides, you know, something like the incident at um, in the Wuhan wet market, what's driving species extinction and loss um, is habitat fragmentation. This might be something that you all are familiar with, but if not, it's always a good refresher. It can look like a lot of different things. Um, right here is, you know, a picture of a housing development, which is fragmented, sliced and diced by houses, roads, not just that, but, you know, the, the new Walmart that goes in and parking lot and all that. Um, so basically, it's a big word, a big fancy word, habitat fragmentation for ecosystems getting chopped up. Um, this means that it's harder for animals to move. And we're not just talking about like big migrations that are about to happen in the fall, just like daily movements, getting to water, getting to food, getting to shelter. Um, they can't move and they essentially get stuck where they are. And, you know, inbreeding happens, genetic depression. And this is a huge, huge issue. Um, we're gonna get into some specific examples, but we've got one right here in Tucson, our beloved border wall, um, pretty much the master habitat fragmentator project um, of 2020 slash the last three and a half years. Um, other examples of habitat fragmentation, you know, massive dam projects. Those of you Monkey Wrench Gang fans might recognize the top right photo of Glen Canyon Dam. Um, there, that's on the left, that's um, somewhere in like Russia or Ukraine. It's one of the biggest mines um, in the world. Down on the far left, that's going to be a familiar site in the greater west, which is all of, you know, fracked gas and oil and gas wellheads that just completely um, exploit the landscape and fragment it. You know, those, those of you that love the Gunnison sage grouse or greater sage grouse, bottom left is like one of their biggest you know, grievances basically is the fragmentation of that landscape. And with habitat fragmentation, it's again, not just breaking up the landscape, it's also the noise that comes with all these projects um, and the lights and so on. So when we do this, we cut species off from their ability to move like they've been doing for millennia and this creates fat, really big problems. And the reason I put that last um, sentence, we need science to help make these decisions of where to place things like dams and mining because we are all human beings that have iPhones and need waters and water and reservoirs and such um, is why we need environmental laws to make these decisions and why having you know corporate influence and special interests at our at the federal and state level frankly making these decisions is a nightmare which is why it's important to vote and engage politically um, so bird watch and engage politically it's a great like balance yin and yang <laughs> um, Again, connecting the dots, I think, you know, a lot of the, the youth climate groups that are around Tucson, they're really coming around to wanting to be more engaged with groups like Defenders and Audubon because they understand that climate change and extinction are not siloed issues. These things, again, drive each other. Um, when, you know, all these like facts that I have on the left about our warming oceans and, and so on and so forth, you know, all these things drastically impact species and we simply, you know, are changing the entire biosphere too fast for them to adapt. So this is an article in the New York Times that came out maybe um, two months ago that I'd recommend reading that explicitly gets into the weeds of that interplay of climate change driving um, extinction. So here it is. Here's the bubble of kind of everything <laughs> that I just talked about to summarize on the right. Climate change is putting pressure on wildlife to survive creating even more stress in their bodies. On the left, we have, you know, deforestation, driving um, extinction, um, extirpation of undesirable predators. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Exploitation of wildlife via trafficking and markets, and of course, development and fragmentation. So we just had the perfect storm to create, hello, I'm coronavirus, or Lyme disease, or so on and so on and so on. Um, so I know, again, it's like a lot to kind of chew on, but really, I think, especially on this webinar, you all are pretty up to speed on probably most of what I've 
covered. And I really do think it's, it's very much up to us as informed citizens to tell our elected officials that these things are connected. Um, and that that is why a huge reason that they need to support um, strong conservation law. Um, I want to touch on, on this because this is a big one, particularly here in Arizona. And I know there's folks on this call from Colorado and you've got a ballot issue um, initiative coming up in November. The big bad wolf, um, you know, we know there's a really nasty pathogen that's lurking in ungulate species. So deer and elk, it's called chronic wasting disease. Um, it's only a matter of time until that thing jumps to humans. And specifically in a state, the state that has the biggest elk and deer populations is Colorado. And Colorado has no wolf. Um, and so we see this like out of balance cycle, right? Like of these, these um, elk and deer that are carrying this disease in huge numbers because, they're, because natural selection has effectively gone away in Colorado. Um, it's also interesting for people that like hate on coyotes. Well, if you introduce the wolf, you, you've rectified that balance as well. So um, there's a lot of resistance and just misinformation about apex predators. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has gone up to the White Mountains to try to see our beautiful Mexican gray wolves. They are the most endangered wolf in the world. Um, it's so hard to see them. Like, uh, you know, my partner and I spent like three days out there trying to see them and you can't see them. So again, I think like we have these bad myths about our apex predators, but they are key in keeping not just deer and elk species in check, but also rodent species. Um, and, the Four Corners region, one in four rodents carry hantavirus, that is insane. That's because when you fragment the landscape, you get rid of apex predators, you have explosive populations of rodents, and it just so happens that one of the most successful species of rodents in the Four Corners is an excellent um, vector of hantavirus. So, you know, again, we, we kind of kind of come in, mess up the cycle, and then we end up isolating populations of different animals that carry diseases that harm and kill us. Um, we're going to get to an action you can take on the Arctic Refuge here in a bit because it's again another um, issue that both uh, Audubon and Defenders of Wildlife stand in solidarity with our partners in Witch and Steering Committee and Sierra Club and a bunch of other um, nonprofits. But you know, the, the, the Arctic is interesting. There's a lot of really scary stuff lurking under the permafrost. Like we know that um, uh, anthrax, which is the microscopic view on the top left of your screen, that that's just one of the pathogens, not to mention all of the methane and a bunch of other you know, greenhouse gases that are trapped under Arctic permafrost. So again, here we have this nexus, right, of like climate change, um, permafrost, like getting rid of habitat for not just polar bears, but actually quite a few nesting birds um, in the, you guys probably all know, or maybe you saw a couple weeks ago that there's most certainly going to be a lease sale probably pretty soon. Um, we think before um, the election, because it's a campaign promise uh, to, to host a lease sale in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. That's why this is a terrible idea. You know, we, we don't need to be um, drilling and exploiting more oil, destroying habitat up there, and then obviously climate change exacerbating Arctic uh, permafrost melt, unleashing all these zombie pathogens. It's just a terrible idea. Um, so when you protect the Arctic refuge, again, it's, um, it's kind of hitting all these points, which I'll get to in a minute. So, yeah, <laughs> we, you know, I don't know that Audubon was part of it, but Defenders was definitely one of nine groups that said, you know, this administration is the worst that we have um, in the history of the United States for the environment because they just repeal and roll back all these laws that just are very, very commonplace for the for everything that I just talked about and more. And I think it's I think it's important to like get into why. Um, like, why are they doing this? Like, I, I sometimes wonder if people are like, but why would Trump cut the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? Like, that makes no sense. Why does, why does he hate birds? Or like, why does he hate polar bears? Like, well, I don't even think he's aware that they exist, but these laws are a measure of industry and corporate accountability. Um, so here's kind of your, your power map. So we've got, you know, the dude on the left, who's, who's the dude in charge. Um, on the right, you've got the Koch brothers, the kingpins of climate change. They 
they deeply, deeply, deeply influence our policy. Um, and I'm get, gonna get to another slide that shows they, there are nearly 50 top federal officials who are former Koch employees. Um, and so we have a special interest nightmare is basically it. Secretary of the Interior, remember that the Department of the Interior oversees our national parks, oversees Fish and Wildlife Service. That dude was a Halliburton lobbyist. Um, you know, Andrew Wheeler on the bottom right, head of the EPA, he was a coal lobbyist. So um, there's a lot, I mean, we could actually even connect more dots here, right, to like campaign finance reform and all that. But I guess the biggest takeaway is that elections are important and they really matter because it's not just the president, it's everybody that goes downstream, I'm using like an ecological term, but <laughs> from the president that makes these you know, makes these decisions that very much impact our laws and um, that protect the things we love. So that's, I think, a, a really important um, point as we come up, you know, on an election to also make to any friends and family um, about, you know, why, like, why is it that all these laws have been repealed, rolled back? Why have we lost monuments? Why are we losing protections for migratory birds? Why, are, why is the ESA getting destroyed and so on and so on? It's because of these, these friends here. Um, literally 16 Trump cabinet secretaries and federal head agencies with Koch ties. Holy moly. I realize some of these people have been quit fired. Unclear if they've been quit or fired like Zinke. But, um, you know, he was replaced by, like, I, like the previous slide just said, a Halliburton lobbyist. So whatever. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, I would recommend reading the book Dark Money or seeing the documentary if you haven't to kind of understand why we're at this point, but it, 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 this is where we're at and this is why this is happening. Um, so again, kind of like we're connecting here, democracy with social justice, with climate change, with extinction, with the current situation. How did we get here? Some of these folks are your answer. Um, just quick review on the Endangered Species Act. Um, because uh, defenders, we are going to have a webinar tomorrow, actually, about um, fighting back against a really nasty rollback. Essentially, Fish and Wildlife Service is um, trying to redefine the word habitat. It's totally absurd, but it's a cool chance for you to get in and um, defend the Endangered Species Act. So I'll put that in the Zoom chat at the very end if you feel like it tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific, um, we're going to go through through the, that very specific rollback and how it came from everything I just told you and then what to do about it. And um, these, again, are two laws that both Audubon and Defenders strongly support, strongly defend. NEPA, um, incredibly, incredibly important, maybe the most important law we have because it protects our democracy. So let's say that you know, somebody wants to put in a big mine right in your backyard in Tucson, they have to tell you when they want to build the mine and what the health hazards might be and where it's going to go and how much it's going to cost. And this is a law that Trump has been attempting to do away with and has massively cut. So again, it's very dangerous, not just for our health and for the environment, for our very democracy. It's really scary that that, um, that, that democratic process is getting stripped away. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I just have to make sure I'm not losing anybody because it's, you know, a lot. So I don't know if you remember Billy Mays, but he was the but wait, there's more, dude. So yes, there is more. Um, this is kind of like a crazy image to take in. I've looked at it probably 20 times and I just um, keep going back to it. And I've even discussed it with coworkers of, you know, again, how all these systems are connected. Why is it that, you know, all of a sudden Audubon and defenders are talking about racial justice and, and all that? Um, because these systems are very much connected and, you know, human supremacy, which is probably the one that we're most familiar with, has deep roots in all these other forms of oppression. So, you know, I know it can be scary to like look at something like this and even get comfortable and familiar with using words like white supremacy and male supremacy, but, um, it's no big deal. Like, this is our reality. And the more that we can lean into even finding collaborative partnerships with these other groups, I think that is just so incredibly exciting. Um, you know, the Sunrise Movement and Arizona Youth Climate Coalition, groups that are more interested in, um, you know, maybe other parts of this square, they, are, they have been some of the first people to pick up 
um, our issues about biodiversity loss. So the more that we can make these connections and find you know, synergy and solidarity with other groups, um, the, more, the more chance we have of you know, protecting the laws that I just described and the things that we love and, and really just um, making it a better world for every person, bird, um, and, and weird little amoebas and parasites, because even, even parasites are, are endangered right now. <laughs> Um, just to touch on that a little bit, I think that we all probably have been seeing a lot of great earned media about, around this, but it's, um, it's really important to remember that, you know, all of that habitat fragmentation, particularly, um, you know, extractive industry, it's, it's mostly taking place in, um, you know, the backyard of someone who we, we're using the acronym BIPOC, meaning Black, Indigenous, or Person of Color. So um, on the top left, you'll see that bright red dot, that's a methane hotspot. And since most of the people on this webinar are at least somewhat familiar with the Southwest landscape, you can see it's right in the Four Corners region, right on Navajo land and Ute land and Hopi land. Um, and so, you know, these, in fact, if you live in Tucson, um, TEP was owned, I think around a quarter of the generating station up in the Navajo nation. And so, again, all these things are colliding. Like, why is it that the highest rates of death from COVID-19 are people of color, are indigenous people? Well, because, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But the one I want to touch on is the environmental aspect. You know, if you have higher rates of asthma and are immunocompromised, well, if you've been living in the shadow of a refinery, there's, you know, it's not setting you up for success in that, in that regard. So, um, you know, also access to clean water. Um, on the bottom right, I know there's some folks from Denver on this call. I moved to Tucson from Denver. The Suncor refinery, that whole um, zip code is the most polluted in America, and it's a Latinx, you know, um, neighborhood. And it's, this is, again, um, why we keep trying to say stuff like environmental justice is social justice. We have to marry these concepts and, and know that we're really fighting the same thing. So um, I'm going to give like a couple examples and then takeaways that you can do. I know this is being recorded, but basically if there's any like notes you want to take, it's the red step in the bottom. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of cool actually, right as I was jumping on this webinar, uh, Gary Navhan, I'm sure a lot of you have read his books. He just emailed me and was like, hey, we have all this data about biodiversity loss as it relates to birds at the border wall. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm actually about to talk about this in like two minutes. So I squeezed in the little factoid that he sent, a massive paper um, where essentially, I don't, I'm not sure who's been doing this project. Um, I think it might be U of A. I need to go back and look because I literally just got the email, but Gary Navahan told me that 25% um, of the 47 bird species recorded since January, from between, between January and August of 2016, 2018 have not been observed. So basic, basically the border wall has caused around a quarter of the birds that we've historically seen at the border wall to disappear. Um, and they're specifically looking, I know, at Keto Bikito Springs, which is, um, you know, a, a, a critical wetland, it's maybe not the wetland, but a watering hole in uh, Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument where the border wall is currently being constructed. So again, when you oppose the border wall, when you call your member of Congress and say, I want you to repeal the Real ID Act, um, I don't support any more, you know, funding for the border wall, you're not just, you're, you're doing multiple things, right? Like, um, this is Tohono O'odham land. There's been a lot of Tohono O'odham involvement in protests recently. Their lands traditionally extend into Mexico. So, you know, we're cutting off their ability to do like a, their sacred salt ceremony, harvest their saguaro every summer. Um, you know, they, I'm sure you guys probably saw that Trump was literally blowing up uh, parts of our national monument system, including indigenous burial sites not cool. So you're hitting on the justice angle. Democracy, again, like to build the border wall. Um, the Real ID Act allows Trump or any president really um, to waive any law they want to build the wall. So the Endangered Species Act in the trash, the Wilderness Act in the trash, They're, they all go in the trash to build the wall. So like what is the point of having laws if we don't follow them? 
Um, so the Real ID Act has to go. If you're going to make any call, I would call Senator Sinema because she has not made a stance against this. Um, and she needs to because it's crazy that this is happening. Um, <clears throat> obviously, climate change, you know, deplete, depleting, I mean, mixing concrete in the middle of the desert is just insane. Um, we know that, like, and Nicole is really the expert on this, but the San Pedro, how they've been draining um, precious groundwater there to build the border wall. It's, it's just awful. Um, the bottom right is a photo that Lake and George Hall, Center for Biological Diversity, took of a bird that flew into the border wall. We also have a lot of low flyers in our borderlands um, that just simply can't make it across. So um, not, not good. But again, you take one action, you're addressing all of these things. So that is super cool. So that's action one. Action two, I know you guys have had tons of info on this, um, but again, Migratory Bird Treaty Act was um, gutted uh, by a former Coke employee, Dan Giorgiani, he used to work for Coke Industries, trashed the law, got rid of any and all industry accountability, very simple things like covering oil pits to protect birds. Um, so, you know, this gets into democracy, justice. It's, it's crazy that as, you know, the law was written that BP could, you know, Deepwater Horizon could happen and BP would be fine, nothing for bird death. So, um, we actually just did a big push, Defenders. Um, I was lobbying a couple members of Congress on supporting the Migratory Bird Protection Act. We actually have Representative Kirkpatrick, Grijalva, Stanton, Gallego as co-sponsors, and we're working on a Halloran right now. So if you actually live in or the Oro Valley area, Marana, if Representative O'Halloran is your member of Congress, I would love it if you um, reach out to his office and just stressed how important it is to you for him specifically to be, you know, upholding these laws. He is not yet a co-sponsor on the MBPA, um, but hopefully he will be. So there's your takeaway. Um, if you're not, if, if your member of Congress is a co-sponsor, you can reach out to me also to figure that out. Just ask them to please vote yes on the Migratory Bird Protection Act. So um, kind of circling back to Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, again, the action is in the bottom. Um, you know, Audubon and Defenders and our allies are all currently in a lawsuit against the Trump administration pushing back on, um, you know, the drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is, again, a massive collaboration. It's a violation of indigenous rights. Um, I was just on an Arctic Refuge corporate call prior to this webinar um, with members of the Gwich'in who you know, it's, it's hurtful to them in a way that like we can't even understand um, for these big oil corporations to come and drill in the place that they call the sacred place where life begins. Um, porcupine caribou herd migrate through the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and they've relied on them for sustenance for since time immemorial. Um, so again, like you don't have to choose what you care about. You can care about it all when you defend the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, climate, justice, extinction, we talked about the pathogens lurking down there. Um, and so again, I'm gonna drop um, a petition into the Zoom chat when I'm through, but um, you know, we basically worked with a representative to introduce something called the Polar Bear Cub Survival Act about a month ago. And essentially what it does is it blocks off drilling access to 90% of the Arctic refuge. Um, and we did that by using the science that very explicitly says that any time that there's, you know, a thumper truck or any type of extractive presence around a polar bear den within about a mile and a half buffer, polar bear moms will abandon the cubs in their dens. It's really terribly sad. I'm sorry to tell you that, but maybe that will motivate you to help. Um, ask your member of Congress to co-sponsor this bill. It's new, it doesn't have a Senate companion bill, but the whole thing we're going for there is again, protecting biodiversity and saying, um, you just, you can't drill here. Um, the, the polar bear population actually that's in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is the one of the most endangered in the world. There's only 900 members back there. So um, this is another thing, like again, when you support this, the Polar Bear Cub Survival Act, for example, you can touch in on all these different pieces to, to defend the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. 
Um, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with how to, you know, contact your legislator, but it's always just a good refresher about this process. You can use house.gov to find who your rep and senator is, um, or are rather. And, you know, if you, if you haven't made a call, I know it can be really nerve wracking for folks, but I just think it's always important to remember that you're just a human talking to another human. Um, especially when you're, when you're making a call, it's usually a pretty young intern who might not even know about the topic that you're talking about. So again, it's a really great chance for you to just speak from the heart in an authentic way and even just talk about, um, you know, what, what I just dropped on you today. Like, hey, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and I understand that it's caused by, um, you know, what happened in the wet markets in Wuhan, but scientists are telling us that if we don't act to address uh, extinction and climate change, more pandemics are on the way. Like, what is your office doing about that? I mean, that's a totally a, a completely viable phone call you can make just to ask. They can take down your information, like your number, or your, your email and get back to you. Um, you know, I should have I should have put this slide in here, but the reason that, uh, especially in my job, I do so much connecting with constituents constituents to their member of Congress is because our data shows that's the most powerful thing, like hands down. Um, they, I have relationships with some of these congressional offices, but they get kind of used to hearing from me. So when I can come into a meeting with one of you all who's able to advocate again, just as like, hey, I live in your district, you're in Congress to represent me and the health and well-being of my community, this is what I want. Um, you know, that is the, hands down the most successful measure of moving a bill, um, getting a co-sponsorship, um, you know, writing, emailing, and calling, those things are all really important. But if you're ever interested in having, right now we're doing only Zoom meetings, but um, they're, they're really powerful opportunities for you to connect directly with, it's usually a staff member of Congress, but um, it's really, really effective. And it, I think, feels really good to kind of like, be like, yeah, I did that thing. Um, you can tweet at them. You know, Terry Tempest Williams is kind of the master of doing super creative things like dropping a big, you know, book of poems about America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. Um, you can do, you know, really the sky's the limit. I think sometimes we get kind of discouraged by this bureaucratic process, but just use it as an opportunity, especially in quarantine, to, um, to do something creative, to get in touch with you know, both state and federal. My job is focused on federal decision makers, but they're all really important. Um, and actually, Nicole and I are going to talk about that in a minute with um, the city of Tucson. Letters to the editor, also cool. Um, one thing I wanted to plug tomorrow and kind of also summarize everything we talked about, this uh, screenshot I took on the left was actually an article that came out today in High Country News, which I thought was just like, man, this is so cool because I don't feel like I'm the only crazy person like <laughs> screaming that these things are all connected. So it was a really great article. I would really encourage you guys to read it, how racism adversely affects wildlife. It just breaks down kind of what we talked about today. Like, um, you know, we know that indigenous managed lands have the highest levels of biodiversity, but the other end of that is, you know, redlining and um, everything we just talked about where, you know, landfills, incinerators, all those things are intentionally placed it negatively affects not just wildlife, but entire ecosystems, watersheds, and so on. So really powerful article I'd really recommend checking out. And then tomorrow I mentioned that we're doing, um, Defenders, our whole national outreach team is doing a webinar um, about one of the rollbacks to the Endangered Species Act. And we called it the spider that stopped a pipeline because <laughs> I think that I just, I just love so much that like, you know, the oil, the fossil fuel industry is extremely um, uh, smart and it's very hard to defeat them. But, you know, a couple months ago, um, actually it was an Audubon chapter in Texas as well as Defenders Center for Biological Diversity and maybe another one of our allies that used the Endangered Species Act that was protecting this really cool spider that's on your top right of your screen um, called the Bone Cave Huntsman. And this really special little relative of ours happened to live in a limestone cave that was directly under the path of a pipeline. And so this is again, like why we have this nexus that's like, right? Like it's democracy, it's climate change, it's 
you know, extinction. And so I just think it's like, I just think it's so funny just thinking about all these like fossil fuel executives just being like, oh, it's the spider that stopped our pipeline. No. And it's just, it's just so great, you know? So um, kind of just like, again, having fun with this whole notion. Tomorrow we'll go over exactly, uh, this is like kind of more of like a skimming webinar. We'll go a little bit deeper into like what the specific rollback is. The comments are due September 4th. We asked the federal government for an extension. Of course, they denied it because they're trying to rush everything through in case Trump doesn't get reelected. So it's important for them to hear from you. Um, you do not have to be a scientist. You just have to have a heart and care about this. It can be really simple comments. Um, so we'll make it fun and that'll be tomorrow at 2 p.m. And that is it. I'm going to um, turn it back over to Nicole and then I'll um, get all the little links that I promised I'd share and drop them in the chat. Yeah, that was, that was all, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I want to just wrap us up by covering, and Erica has given us a lot of great actions, um, but I think it's really important to always end with what you can do about all of this. And in this case, just as Erica has gone over for us, since everything is so connected, right, our options on how you want to engage are also very extensive. Um, so just one example here in Tucson, um, coming up on our next mayor and council agenda, which is September 9th, they're going to be considering a climate emergency declaration. And why this is important for all of us is because climate change is kind of our biggest threat right now, not only to us, but to birds as well. And um, we have submitted comments that especially highlight climate change's threat to birds and how that connects to our community here in Tucson, because we've all seen the impacts um, that birds have in our community from tourism um, to just the joy and aesthetic beauty that, that birds bring to our lives. So I would encourage everyone, we're going to be sending out an action alert with a really easy way to just send in your support for that declaration um, to the city. Um, very much the more they hear from you, the better. They always read out how many comments they've received on the issues um, and really appreciate, especially hearing specifically from people in their districts. So you can figure all that out online and we'll send out details on, on, on how to do that. Um, so with that and all of Erica's actions, I feel like that's a good sweep. And again, I'll make sure that we include our link to the virtual flyway in the email. That's kind of just another way you can plug in, right? Use your creative side use your voice and, and tell your stories. And that just helps connect all the dots for our decision makers, right? Like, why do people care about this? Why do they care about birds? What are their stories? And this is one way for us to share that. So I wanna make sure that if people have questions, we have time to address them. I've been kind of watching this great discussion going on in the chat. Um, I would invite everyone to drop their questions in there or else you can use the raise hand function which if you go to the bottom of your screen and bring up all those little options, you can click on participants. And then at the bottom of your participants member is this little thing that has a little hand, says raise hand. And if you click that, you will come to the top of my participants list and I can unmute you. There are enough of us where if you just raise your hand in your screen, I will not see you. <laughs> um, so definitely use that feature. Um, drop your questions in. Thanks, um, Erica, for sending put those links in the chat. I'll download this chat so that we can include all those in the follow-up email along with the recording later. So that makes it easy for everyone. So you don't have to copy and paste everything right now. All right, questions. I need to open up the chat window so I can see it again to see if we have any that we haven't addressed yet. And definitely raise your hand if you want to ask a question out loud. I saw one um, about somebody uh, being frustrated about just getting um, <clears throat> voicemails and calling. That's such a great question. Um, so I will say this, that, you know, it does matter. And I know this because recently um, I basically had to sound an alarm to get a bunch of folks I know to contact Congressman Gray Halva um, since he chairs House Natural Resources Committee um, about this issue in Nevada, which is like so crazy and not something I even work on. But since, you know, I'm in his district, um, that was the task at hand. And 
you know, the, those phone calls, like we know it worked because my colleagues in DC, my whole, my whole team is in DC, um, told me like they heard from Congressman Grijalva's staff kind of like it, it gets annoying basically after a while. So I know that like it, you know, it, it's like talking to a wall sometimes, particularly now when like a lot of those staffers are working remotely. Um, but it does drive pressure, especially like again from constituents because ultimately these politicians want to get reelected. So if they feel like that's at risk, uh, they're more likely to do something. Um, I would say though, that again, I'll put my email in this chat. If that's something that you're interested in in doing, um, getting a little bit more involved, like having um, meetings with staff members, that is something that any, you know, public person can and should do. I just know that there's like a lot of intentional layers of bureaucratic mystery that make it seem hard. But again, like um, I would love to help anybody that's interested in that process get connected with their elected official and actually have like a meeting, even if it's 15, 30 minutes of expressing why. Um, I think it's important for them to see your face too. So um, I know that it I know that it is really frustrating just calling, um, and I share that and I empathize with it. But I still will encourage you to do it, uh, just because I know that it does work. That kind of pressure build up, especially when there's a lot of calls. So yeah. I'll just echo that. You know, every time you think that you're getting that it's no one's listening, it's they're not responding. You are getting they are noting it. And they're adding all those calls up. So like we just did a call in for seabirds, which from Arizona people were very much like, what, why are we talking about seabirds? And the staffers had no idea that we cared about this issue. And we had 50 people from Arizona call in and they're like, wow, 50 people from Arizona care about seabirds. All those people, I guarantee you, did not get a call back, did not get a, you know, a nice note back because it's, it's just one staffer. So that can be pretty hard for one staffer, right? Um, but they definitely noted that and it made a big difference. And they're also then able to be educated on that topic because again, one or two staffers, all the topics in the world, we need to make sure that we're bringing these issues to their attention. So your call does make a difference even if no one's replying. Yeah. All right. Not sure if we didn't get any other questions. Will this session be available on Facebook? I'm, we haven't really, we're not, we're not that technologically forward yet. Um, we, I, I know we've, we've talked about this. Um, once you have the recording, you're definitely feel free to share that with someone that if you're trying to share it on Facebook, for example, um, they are going to be up on YouTube eventually. So that's another option. Martha had a question about um, <clears throat> writing letters, letter writing campaigns. Um, I guess I'll say two things about that. So one, I think like um, a personal letter is is extremely powerful. In fact, I went into Senator Cinema's office a couple of months ago and you know, I kind of had the traditional like postcards that you'd sign at one of our tables, but I also had some letters that some people wrote that were pretty intense. And um, I know that each of those person, each of those people got a letter back. Um, I don't think it said what they wanted them to say, but I do think that it, it's still kind of that piece of like um, building up pressure. And I would also say, um, I know this isn't really part of Martha, your, your question, but like what happens when you sign petitions that kind of seems worthless? Um, it's not, especially like for folks like Nicole and I, like I just um, pressured Representative O'Halloran about the Migratory Bird Protection Act as a follow-up, and I actually was able to say, hey, just so you know, um, there were X many constituents in your district that signed a petition in support of the Migratory Bird Protection Act. So basically, like, when you do that with one of us, like the ones that I dropped in the chat about the Polar Bear Cub Survival Act or Migratory Bird Protection Act, um, it helps us, like, basically go in and represent you. And I'm, I can't speak for all petitions, but it is very helpful just as a numbers thing for me to, me or Nicole or whoever to walk in a meeting and be like, it's not just Defenders and Audubon. We have this many petitions in our hands right here with names and addresses of people in your district that care about this. So um, 
that is, you know, it, it all matters and it all counts and it all works, even though I know it can feel like it's going into like a, a, a black hole. Uh, if you write a letter, does it have to more impact the Senate electronic? I would say either one, um, electronically or paper mail. I don't think it really matters. Um, either way, I think that your message will be received in coronavirus, maybe electronically, because I don't know how often people are going to their offices. So yeah. great questions. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one, a couple comments we've got on voting. Um, and I just wanted to stress how important that is coming up. Our next Vermilion Flycatcher is gonna have a whole spotlight on why voting is so important. And I think what Erica has talked about today, we see the consequences of what happens when, you, when we fail to vote. And when someone we prefer, would prefer not to be in office, gets into office and the damage that can be done from that, because it's way easier to tear, tear something down than to build it up, right? We know this. Um, and there was a really good research that was done before the last election that showed that you know, the number of people that are putting climate change as their number one issue has risen by a lot from like two to 14% of all voters. That's huge. But yet, 10 to 15 million of those people are not voting. So what's happening, right? We know that, that the issue is important and yet we're not voting. So I think it's, it's this failure that Erica's talking about to connect these dots together and to see how that's all important and why voting for that person who's in charge can have huge cascading effects onto all the things that we care about. So I just wanna stress that if you care about these issues and you're one of those very common people that still is not voting in every election, right? Not just our upcoming major elections, but for local city council on referendums and all these things, your votes make a huge difference. And they're still one of the most important things that you can do to make sure that our democracy stays intact. So, all right. I think those are all our questions. If anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, feel free to do so at this point. Um, and again, we'll follow up with all the links and um, everything that we said we would include in the email. <laughs> all right. But otherwise, everyone have a great day. Thank you, Erica, so much for joining us again. I'm sure we'll, we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for showing up. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Erica. Can, right. you, can you download or copy the chat? I know there's a way to do that. And I yep. don't know if I just don't have permission to do Save that. Save chat. Chat is saved. Want me to send that over to you and Erica? Yeah, sure. That's yeah, fine. cool. Will do. And I'll, um, Erica, I'll include the link to tomorrow's presentation in the follow up email. Cool. I'll send you some of the other ones too, because I know I dropped a lot. Okay. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks for that. Thanks, guys. All right. See you all later. Thank you. Bye.